Two neighboring nations, a history of disagreement and wars from the 6th century through imperial Japanese rule in the 20th century to today's mutual economic sanctions. While Japan is a bigger nation, it had no real threat since World War II. In the meantime, South Korea faced a grave threat from its northern neighbor for decades, and thus its military grew to be as potent as the Japanese one. So what would a hypothetical war between those two East Asian powerhouses look like? A strong cyber ops force plays a vital role in warfare. They disrupt the opponent's infrastructure via internet and steal their data. Of course, that's on a large scale against the government, but similar procedure applies to protection of individuals. If you want your data to be secured as you send messages, photos and browse the web, use a virtual private network. NordVPN, which is sponsoring this video, offers just that. Feel free to go to nordvpn.com slash binkov to check out their offer. NordVPN encrypts your data and reroutes your connection through one of their 5000 servers. You can pick any of the 62 countries offered to have your IP address changed. You can thus switch countries to watch exclusive content, like on Netflix or other streaming services. NordVPN is available on Windows, macOS, Linux, iOS and Android, and you can have up to six simultaneous connections at once. Use the link below nordvpn.com slash binkov and the code binkov and you'll get four more months free and 70% off NordVPN at only $3.49 per month. You will also get four additional months free with a three-year plan. So check out my link below. Let's now go back to Korea versus Japan. The two nations may seem like David and Goliath. Japan's population is more than twice as big. Its economy is almost three times as big. But when it comes to the military, the difference is much less pronounced. Japan's defense expenditure is barely bigger than Korean, as it spends much less of its federal budget on the military. So if we had a hypothetical war with no outside interference, no allies and the final goal of taking as much of enemy territory as possible and or destroying as much of other side's military as possible, who would come out on top? Obviously, any military action would have to be performed over the sea. Japan does have a noticeably bigger navy. It has more helicopter carriers and they're bigger. Korean ship is also an amphibious assault ship, which makes it more multi-purpose, but also prevents it from excelling in the helicopter carrier role. Submarine-wise, the two sides may seem similar, but Japanese subs are much larger ocean-going vessels with great endurance. Korean subs are mostly designed for protection of their own waters. Finally, there is a visible mismatch when it comes to surface combatants. In air defense, the Japanese are far ahead and have twice as many Aegis ships. Japan also has three times as many general-purpose ships, all of them bigger than Korean ones. Where the South Korean Navy does pull ahead is small littoral combatants for defense of their own coastline. Given the small distance from Japan to South Korea, those two could perform offensive actions at certain places, though they are only anti-ship platforms, lacking in anti-submarine capabilities. But the naval forces would be only part of the equation, deciding who'd control the seas air forces would very much control those seas, given how close the two countries are one to another. South Korea has more combat planes in total, but the fair share of their fleet are close support planes. Japan, on the other hand, has some units specialized for anti-shipping missions. When modern jets meant to achieve air superiority are compared, the tables shown look different. The Korean F-35 unit lacks numbers and maturity to declare operational capability, so their usage would not be optimal. On the other hand, 100 Japanese F-15s are not modernized and are basically Cold War relics. South Korea has some older generation F-16s, but they have been modernized in the last 10 years. F-16s are of course smaller and inherently less capable in the role of air superiority. But fighter jets exchanging missiles is just part of the deal. Who would have better situational awareness? Who could strike first on the opposing side's air bases, locking down part of their fleet? The Japanese have more aerial early warning planes. Their E-2 planes have a dual role of scanning the ocean as well, but their command capability is lacking compared to larger planes. South Korea does have one ace card. It has the capability to perform standoff strikes on Japanese soil. Given the relatively short distance to Japan, a lot of Japanese military sites like airbases could be threatened. 
half a dozen missiles that managed to go through the defenses and achieve precise hits on each Japanese base in the vicinity might be enough to shut down air operations for several hours. Enough, perhaps, to ensure pockets of air superiority somewhere over the seas. Many more missiles would need to be used per attack, of course, as Japan has rather robust anti-ballistic missile defenses. Then again, Japan is rather large, with many possible targets to be protected. While dispersion is good against missile attacks, it's not so good for layered air defenses. Going over mainland Japan with fighter jets would be suicidal for Korea, though. Japanese air defenses are quite varied, and Japan would enjoy the benefit of dozens of its ground-based radars aiding in situational awareness for their interceptor planes. Japanese strike capabilities are very much limited, though. They simply could not hope to fly over Korea and bomb much, or impede air ops at Korean air bases. That's because not only do the Japanese lack any sort of standoff missiles, but their own doctrine was a very defensive one. Only some 15 years ago did they start buying some guided bombs, and only 5 years ago did they purchase their first targeting pods. All other Japanese planes lack precision bombing capability, and even the existing JDAM and small diameter bomb inventory isn't that great. Besides JDAMs, South Korea uses small diameter bombs, paveways, Popeye bombs, guided cluster bombs and Maverick missiles. South Korean air defenses are less potent than Japanese ones. However, the number of Japanese planes being capable of strike missions is also much lower. And South Korea is quite compact, unlike Japan. So there would be more of a coverage overlap between said defenses over Korea. In all likelihood, there would be a rush to get to the territories that are a bit easier to control, the outlying islands. Olando is fairly close to Korea. The contested Dokdo or Takeshima Islands are currently under Korean rule. But given how they're basically big rocks, it's questionable if Japan would even bother making them the priority of their attacks. Jeju Island is a big potential prize to take, but it's also easier to defend for Korea, as it's fairly close. Another big issue is that it's a large island with infrastructure that could support a large defensive force. The biggest fights are likely to happen over the Tsushima Islands. Their history features disputes where Korea claimed them, but in 1951 Korea did acknowledge Japanese ownership. That would not prevent Korea from trying to claim it once again in our fantasy scenario. Tsushima is almost in the middle of the two countries, though slightly closer to Korea. While there are no big army units stationed there, Japan would likely try to reinforce it right away, but Korea might rush to it as well, trying to preempt that. Tsushima isn't tiny and its topography is very demanding. It's all hills and vegetation, with no room for heavy systems. The three Japanese units that are there number roughly a thousand personnel, with roughly a battalion-sized maneuver unit. South Korean rapid reaction, airborne and amphibious forces are roughly five times bigger though. They're also supported by a larger amphibious assault fleet. Korean ships are on average smaller, due to the fact their real-world threats aren't that far away. Japanese, on the other hand, need larger ships to service their faraway islands in the south. Of course, Korea would also use their Dokdo ship at this stage of the conflict, even if it meant it would not be available as a helicopter carrier in the open sea missions. So the planes would battle in the skies over Tsushima with no real winner. The Japanese might have a stronger fleet on paper, but part of that fleet would be unavailable due to Korean strikes on air bases. And compact Korean geography means they could also threaten most of Japan and protect their homeland, all from their original bases. Japan, on the other hand, would likely need to keep at least some small interceptor forces in both the southern islands, on Hokkaido and around Tokyo, fairly far away from the Tsushima Strait. Without that, they risk giving Korea the green light to strike their mainland without fear. Where the Japanese do excel is their naval power. In an open ocean battle, the Koreans would most likely lose. But given the strait, it would be unwise for either side to go in with their navy and try to establish a line of ships near the opponent. While the Japanese might enjoy the benefits of their stronger air defenses on their ships, those ships would still be very much threatened by both air forces and coastal anti-ship batteries, which both sides use. Submarines would perhaps be the best for blocking the strait, but again, the open ocean capability of Japanese subs could not be fully exploited in the confines of the strait. 
helicopters and anti-sub patrol planes might try to engage the subs, but given the absolute massacre in the skies going on over the strait, it's not likely those could be useful until one side does establish at least some kind of air superiority. Which might take weeks, with the given balance of power. That being said, Japan does have over three times as many anti-sub helicopters and planes. Mine warfare would also come into play, with Japan pulling ahead, once it manages to put those assets close to the battlefield. When it comes to transport planes and helicopters delivering troops and supplies by air, the two sides are somewhat comparable, though Japan is slightly ahead. The gap is lessened by helicopters, though Korean ones are on average a bit smaller. Still, the number of troops both sides could airlift to the contested islands is considerable. The larger pool of Korean soldiers trained for such ops might benefit them, once some of the incursions inevitably go through, flying low. If a ground battle does happen on Tsushima, or if Japan tries to use the island as a platform for their radars or missile batteries, South Korea does have another card it can play. Its pool of long-range rocket artillery is visibly bigger. Japan and Korea do use US-made multiple rocket launchers with decent missiles, but Korea has added locally manufactured assets. With those systems and their guided rockets, South Korea could keep laying down fire onto Tsushima Island, either supporting their own assaults on the island or to prevent the Japanese from accumulating their forces on the island. Japanese artillery does have some similar systems but in smaller numbers, and their own launchers would be more threatened by Korean airstrike from standoff distances. Korea does enjoy many more air support planes and pilots trained for such missions. Another source of fire support would be attack helicopters. South Korea pulls ahead there, with more helicopters. Both sides make heavy use of lighter helicopters for scouting and also standoff strikes. Getting troops by ships, however, may be quite hard for Korea, due to Japanese naval superiority and all the submarines and mines present. Still, Koreans would likely press on and may enjoy some success with sending troops via amphibious vehicles and hovercraft launched far away from the island. Aerial incursions would likely be more fruitful, at least until a foothold is established on the island, allowing some boats to be used as well. Once various other support assets can be brought in, it's likely Japanese naval assets would have a much harder time in the strait. Other farther away islands, like the ones in the East China Sea, would not likely see much action. With the Japanese Navy being larger and better suited to the ocean, it would be almost impossible for Korea to take and hold any of those islands to the south. When it comes to the often talked about Dogdo and other northern islands, the fact Korea does already hold the islands in the first place helps them a lot. The larger Olan Island may serve them as a nice stepping stone to defend Dogdo. The rest of the territory of the two countries would likely not even get contested. It would be impossible to get any sort of army force on either Japan or South Korea proper and hope to hold down the area. The disparity between thousands or a few tens of thousands of disembarked troops versus a hundred thousand or more counter-attacking troops would be too much, especially with the defenders enjoying heavy stuff like tanks and artillery. Indeed, when it comes to ground army, South Korea is visibly stronger in almost all areas. They have far more soldiers. Even though they're mostly conscripts, the heavy training regime does make them quite useful. They've got more tanks and fighting vehicles. Interestingly, specific Korean requirements means their K-21 infantry fighting vehicle can be made fully amphibious. And they've definitely got more artillery of various kinds. Their sheer numbers would likely prevent the Japanese from making many advances in any sort of a ground fight where Koreans are defending, like retaking parts of Tsushima. The reason behind such disparity in numbers is rather simple though. For decades South Korea built its forces for a ground war against North Korea, especially for deterring hundreds of thousands of infantrymen. They thus invested their military budget into the ground army first, with less money going into the Air Force and Navy. Even with those two, one can see North Korea was still in their sights. Japan was on the other hand pretty much protected from a ground invasion from the Soviet Union, being an island and having the US to jump in. Their army is therefore fairly small. They were primarily tasked with holding the fort in the Cold War, holding the Soviet Navy until US forces could come in numbers. Their focus on anti-submarine assets is especially visible. Even when it comes to the Air Force, the focus on defense and interception and almost no airstrike capability is something that still haunts them. 
Japan does pull ahead in some areas, of course. It has more recon satellites, for example. But the difference would not really help them hold on to Tsushima Island. Both sides do have significant weapons industries. However, Japan does have a much larger economy. The sheer size of it would mean that, given enough years, Japan would rebuild their forces and conscript many more soldiers. If the conflict was to last for years, Japan might very well take Tsushima Island back, and probably take some of the Korean islands as well. But talking about the year-long conflict, the Korean military is simply better suited to this war of neighbors. It would likely suffer a few times greater casualties while taking Tsushima, and it would lose most of its navy, while the Japanese navy would likely still be around. It would also negate the Japanese air power, but possibly lose even more planes than Japan in the process. So South Korea could call itself a victor, for taking some territory from a bigger and richer nation. Whether that victory would really be meaningful would be another matter. Thanks for watching! And feel free to subscribe to our channel! Don't forget to hit that bell button for notifications about our future uploads. And remember, if you want to help us make more videos, consider becoming our patron. And remember, Binkov may talk about hypothetical wars, but only real peace can bring us all together.